Lord be began to speak to me. This is the year of the open door. Uh, Dwayne was mentioning this. It was prophesied or Jeff at the first of the year began to speak about the open door and that God has given <clears throat> and is bringing the open door to your life. There's opportunities. And, uh, and that comes from uh, the Jewish New Year. You know when that begins? It begins at Rosh Hashanah, which is in September of last year. <clears throat> and it's when the Jewish calendar recognizes a new year beginning. Okay? And somehow they figure out by something, and I can't get into it, they figure out that it translates because the Hebrew numbering system coordinates with their lettering system or something to that degree. You'll have to ask Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> but because of that, they can, they can determine that this is established as this is the year of the door, the open door. That's simply translated to us as a year of opportunity. It actually means a portal or a gateway. But there's opportunity God lays in our path in this particular year, and he's going to allow us to enter areas that we have not been in before. And he's doing that in your life. We certainly see that <clears throat> going before us in Brother Jeff's life and others in here, their lives are, are, are going before us, and we're seeing great opportunities unfolding for Jeff as he's ministering all over the place overseas, it's amazing the effect and the draw God has put in other men's life to Jeff because he has the word of God. That's it. It's not a personality thing. It's nothing uh, like that. It's just that the Holy Spirit has opened a door and he's walked through. Are you listening to me? So thank God this is the year for you on an open door. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you. I'll try to make this short because I don't want to, I don't want to cut off anything that Brother Jeff would like to say. So let me read this to you here. And then I'll read 1 Corinthians 16, 9, which we have talked about. But Jesus said, no man, when he has lighted a candle, cover it with a vessel, but he puts it or puts it under the bed. But he set it on a candlestick that they may that, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Now, 1 Corinthians 16, 9. For a great and effectual door is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. When God brings a door, an opportunity into your life, with that opportunity comes a strategy on how to enter in and possess the land that's beyond that open door. I'm convinced in my life, and many of us here today, there's times when God has brought an open door and we've done nothing but stood on the doorstep, the welcome mat, and peered over in there and wondered, well, look at that. Man, I wish I could go beyond where I'm at right now. I see there's much more for me, and I wish I could experience it. What you need and what I need is a strategy, a plan, an understanding of what steps God would have you to have right now to get and explore this new territory that he has laid before you. One of the things Jeff was talking about today is what I was going to mention today, and he already did. He stole my thunder. <laughs> but it's one of the absolutely essential doors of opportunity that God brings at our feet. And a lot of times we don't recognize, you know, that's another thing. We don't recognize always the opportunities God brings in our life. You know why? Because it's spiritual. I mean, it's easy to see, hey, I've just been offered a job making twice what I'm making now. What an opportunity. Yeah, that's an easy one to see, isn't it? And that don't mean it's God to do that either. But, you know, you can see that. Wow, this is an opportunity here. That's easy to see. But the spiritual opportunities God brings sometimes is not recognizable because we're thinking so much wrong. And one of the opportunities Jeff was talking about today, he invited us by the Spirit of God, is to go deeper into the things of the Spirit of God. One of the simple things is your prayer language. Has it developed? 
Are you speaking in tongues on a daily basis? Are you praying in the spirit on a daily basis? You should be, absolutely should be. It should be an absolute essential part of your prayer life to pray and spend time praying in the spirit. And you'll find as you do, God will give you a greater increase of the different dialects that you are speaking you do not understand but you're speaking things in the spirit. You're speaking mysteries unto God, the Bible says. You're speaking divine secrets. You're speaking out what is God's perfect will when you're praying in another tongue. You're giving thanks when you pray in another tongue. There's so many things the Bible says happens when you pray in the spirit. Young people, everyone in here, if you're born again and if you know Jesus as Lord, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak and be given a prayer language to pray in. Are you listening to me? And then as Jeff has said, as you start to grow in the things of the Spirit of God, you'll learn, I have a greater dialect here. The, the Lord is giving me a greater understanding of speaking things in the Spirit. Amen. Y'all try to calm down. When you come to an end of a season in your life and there's transition for you, God always brings you to an open door. When you have another season come and you successfully make it, all along the way, there are open doors. There are other opportunities. The key to your life being successful is moving with God and going through each door, each time he opens it, and flowing with him. With that door comes a strategy. And that's one of the things the Lord spoke to me originally when I was studying this. He said, my people get to the door, but they don't know how to get beyond it. So I'm going to show you real quick in the scriptures what the Bible says. Because what I have to say really doesn't matter. But let's see what the Bible says. You know, finding a door isn't a big issue. A lot of people... I know in my life, I've looked for opportunities for years. I wonder when this is going to happen for me. I wonder when that's going to happen for me. <clears throat> it doesn't, it's not a big deal to come to an open door. You know why? Because that's the Lord's job. He will bring you that opportunity. It's recognizing it, and then it's entering into it through a plan and a strategy of the will of God. And that's what we're going to, I'm going to show you in the Word how that unfolds. Faith is always required in going through <clears throat> a new area and a new door. Faith is always required. I'm going to be reading <clears throat> a few scriptures here out of Joshua. The fourth chapter is taken when Israel finally went around that mountain for 40 years. The old unbelieving, complaining, murmuring generation, they died off. Remember this? After they fussed and carried on and cried and murmured and complained and belly ate, God said, you know what, boys, y'all going to walk around here till you die off. Everybody 20 years and younger is going to go in to what I promised. Are you listening? So there was a new generation that had come up, and the old had died off, and they come right around that mountain, and there was the River Jordan. And so God brought them to the door as he is bringing you. When you obey the Lord and walking with him, He's bringing you to new opportunities in your life. Uh, it's just not for a bunch of old people with gray hair. If you're alive and breathing, it's for you. <clears throat> Young and old, there's a season and a door for you to occupy and to live in at this time. Joshua the 4, the fourth chapter. Let me read a few things. And I'll just tell this to you, and I'll read over this quick. When God brings you to an open door, there's certain things he wants you to do. There's a remembering, a forgetting, and a change of provision. And then there's an encounter, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. In Joshua, the fourth chapter, Joshua instructed these men, when you enter in <clears throat> to the Jordan, he assigned 12 men out of every tribe. And he said, I'll just make it Byron's... Uh, interpretation here, his translated version, okay? Twelve guys out of the tribe. He said, boys, when we get across this Jordan, you guys reach in there and grab a stone. Each one of you, for each tribe, grab one stone and bring it out with you when you come to the other side. So they did. 
12 guys that had gone through, they picked up these rocks and carried them over there. They piled them up in a little pile. And Joshua said, this will be a memorial forever that God has brought you across this river. That he parted it, he brought this opportunity to you. And it'll be a memorial forever of what God has done. Do you know one of the things that God is saying to us here? He wants us to remember his faithfulness. After 40 years, and you can read the history, do you know everything Israel went through? Man, they went through all because of their disobedience, because they just missed God. You read their history, how much stuff they went through, how they missed it so many times, how God had to correct them. And when it came down to it, God says, what you carry over here is this. I have been a faithful God who has fulfilled my word according and for your life. Do you know what? God is faithful over you. He will bring it to pass. Faithful is he who has called you. He will also do it. And God wants you to remember and think back on his faithfulness over your life. You know, I went through a season here a while back before I moved here of loss. I mean, I, I just, I was, went, I went through losing everything. <clears throat> I lost a business. Everything, every time I'd come home, the refrigerator quit working, something happened. The stove, I mean, you know, it's just there. We ended up, before we moved here, living out of an igloo box <clears throat> and having just enough money to go down there and get, get a few things and put in there for a day or two and have to get more ice. Cars broke down, wrecks. I mean, I came to the end. I went through a season of that. And you know what? For after that, even when that season changed for me, you know what I remember? I just kept thinking, man, something's about to go wrong. You know, I'm so used to everything going wrong in my life. This wasn't just a couple of weeks. This was months I went through. I kept thinking, well, you know, this, this sounds good, but, Lord, it's liable to stop tomorrow. I don't know. And that was a very ne negative way to think, isn't it? Have you ever been through something like that? If you live long enough, you'll be tempted to do that. And it took God, the Holy Ghost, working with me to finally start rooting some of that out of me because I'd been through a season of loss. And you know what? It hurts. I can't imagine some of the loss that some of you have gone through, loved ones, relationships, <laughs> betrayal of dear friends, uh, you just name it. You go down to all the losses you can experience. But you know what? This is what the soul will try to do at every loss. This is what I try to do. I try to figure out why. <clears throat> I did. I tried to figure out why. You know what? Deuteron Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. The secret thing belongs to the Lord. But those things that are revealed belong to us. There's some things you'll never figure out. Why did that happen? How could that happen? What did I do wrong? I was contacted by a young man who lost his mother at an early age. And he said, I want to talk to you because I don't want to go through what my mom went through. And I don't want to suffer the way she suffered and I don't want to have a lack of faith that she had when she died. And I said, son, you can't judge why she passed away. You can't sit here and say in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah, it was a lack of faith. You don't know. That's the secret thing between that woman and her father in heaven. The secret things that you're not privy to, they belong to God. <clears throat> There are things in your life you will never be able to explain. But you know what you can't explain? God is faithful to bring me this far, and I'll keep going. God wants you to get in the practice of rehearsing his faithfulness through every devastating circumstance and loss. You can look back and say, yes, but I see God kept me. He was with me, and I'm here today alive. Because it was God who saw me through. Are you listening to me? Yes. Amen. One of the most impacting teachings 
I received from Brother Randy when I came years ago, when coming to camp meetings, you know, <clears throat> was out of Jeremiah 15, when he started talking about separating the precious from the vile. You all remember this teaching? <clears throat> Let me see if I can find that. Yeah, listen to this in Amplified. Jeremiah was complaining. Surely not, but he was. He's just like me and you, isn't he? Oh, me. Let's say that. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you indeed be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail and are uncertain? He's saying, he's saying this to the Lord. And this is what the Lord would say to him. If you return and give up this mistaken tone of distrust and despair, then I will give you a settled place of quiet and safety, and you will be my minister. If you separate the precious from the vile, cleansing, I love this, your own heart from unworthy and unwarranted suspicions concerning God's faithfulness, you shall then be my mouth absolutely ascension in your life. You can say, Father, I don't know why this happened, and I don't know why I'm going through this, but Father, you have been faithful and good to me, and you're always that way, and you begin to separate, not the vile from the precious. We know this teaching here, but the precious. You start recalling the precious things, one after the other after the other. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you. I saw, and you remember the good times and not the sorrow. You don't remember the grief in your heart, the sorrow in your heart, but you remember the thankfulness of all that God did in that situation. Somebody say amen. amen. I love that. Amen. So you absolutely have to say, no matter what the last season brought for you, God has brought me this. I have put a memorial in my life. I will remember over these 40 years of trials and desert time, the good things, the faithfulness of God. Okay. Next thing. The next thing he told him, I'm going to give you something to forget. He wanted you to get, he's getting our minds right, basically right here, before we get into a new area. That thing that kept you out of it for so long, he's getting it right. It's right up in here. Joshua 5. Let me read it. Verses 2 and 3 and 8 and 9. <clears throat> that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make you sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel. For the second time, and Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of foreskins. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away from you the reproach of Egypt off of you. Wherefore, the name of that place is called Gilgal unto this day. <clears throat> he rolled away the reproach. God is wanting to roll away the reproach of whatever you've been through. Whatever you deem in your life, you're a failure at. Whatever you have said, I've missed God and I blew it. And if I just wasn't so and you fill in the blank, I would be so much better off. And we get into this situation of beginning to remember the vile <clears throat> and seeing it in our lives. And you know what? It surely may be there. But once you believe and trust in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And instead of when you fall, having to go back to the starting line, when you fall, you just get up and keep going. That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. <clears throat> Listen to this. Paul said it this way. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to that which is before, I press toward the mark of the prize. See, once again, there's some things you're never going to I, I tell you, there's a certain line of thought I deal with even now, laying in my bed at night, that will come upon me without me even knowing it's there. And if I pursue it, you know what happens? I'll say it Texan. I will take a whooping. 
I cannot get around it. I can't figure it out. I don't know why certain things happened. I don't know why the, what I did wrong. I can't figure out. I keep trying to figure out what did I do wrong? How did that happen? And I get back into that old thing and I am whooped <clears throat> until God takes me and shakes me and says, son, forget those things that are behind. You're not going to understand it. That secret thing belongs to me. What reveals to you is what is yours, and what is revealing is it's time to get up and get out of this place you're at in your mind and go on and remember my faithfulness and my love and my help, and let's go on down the big road. You hear that? A little truck driver in there? All right. The secret thing belongs to the Lord. Listen to this. I'll say this, and just this, this is no extra, no charge. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 15, listen to this. And truly, if they had been mindful of the company from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Mindful, you know what that means? To rehearse, to recall. You know, some people <clears throat> have never left that hospital room, that funeral home, that broken relationship, that courtroom where that thing was finalized, that divorce that office where you were called in the office and fired, <laughs> whatever you name it, whatever you say, that horrible fight you had with your loved one, whatever breach came into your life, some people have never left that room. Why? You can tell it when they're talking to you. Years when I was in pastoral ministry, years I had people come in, born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, walking with God, and they would recall what happened 20 years ago as if it just happened. Somebody broke their heart, and they've never gotten over it. They never left that room where that argument and horrible fuss continued. They keep rehearsing that in their mind. And that scripture right here says, because of that, you will keep in that country that needs to be forgotten. You won't remember the memorial of my faithfulness that brought you here through all your hurt, through all your pain, through all your suffering, through all your tears, through all your grief. You won't remember, but you'll remember the heartbreak that you had. Jesus says, forget it. You don't figure it out yet, but you might know and you might not, but let's get up and go. And you will not rehearse it anymore. You be the porter over your own thought life, over your own mind. And when that comes up and that thing makes you angry or makes you sad and cry, you say, no, I'm out of that room. I'm not going to rehearse this. I'm not going to be mindful and remain in that country of disappointment, of heartbreak, of grief and suffering. I'm going to get up and leave it. I remember when I was a young man, 20 I was 20. I hadn't been 21 yet. I was shot in the stomach with a 45 handgun. In the apartment we lived in, the bullet came through the wall and hit me right here. Renee and I were at the dinner table doing some paperwork. I was frustrated because a check bounced. And, you know, we had hundreds of dollars in the account. We didn't have hundreds, but I thought we had. And I got frustrated. I remember hitting the table and standing up, and bam! And I grabbed my stomach, and a bullet hit me. It came right through the wall. To make a long story short, this 20-year-old kid, wet behind his ear still, married three months before, something like that, ended up at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. Laid up there <clears throat> several hours with a bullet lodged over here in my side, and they kept wanting to take me, but because of Parkland is a county hospital, they'd have people coming in there almost dead that they were putting in before me, you know, <clears throat> and they wouldn't give me anything for pain till just before the surgery. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> that's not a lot of fun. <clears throat> well, finally, after about an eternity, they shot me up full of morphine, and I just prayed it last till they get me in there and put me under. They did. I woke up in the hospital, and I was, then I just thought I was in pain before. <laughs> then I had a big old cut from here yonder 
way down yonder in here in it and my and I couldn't move. You talk about suffering, you try to call for clear your throat, you're like, oh no. <clears throat> And sure enough, they said, they come in there, a couple of guys come there after a day, said, Mr. Smith, you're getting a pneumonia. We need to set you up and have you cough. I said, good luck, boys. <laughs> and I said, I don't know if you boys recognize this big cut on my gut, but I ain't got nothing to cough with. Well, you got to cough anyway. Well, they hit me on the back a few times trying to get me to cough, but I passed out on them. <laughs> there, boom. <clears throat> if I remember laying in that hospital room, I had been laid off of work before I got shot. I'll make this short. I'd gotten a job that very day after looking for about a month and a half. Finally got a job. That night I get shot. I'm laying up in here in this hospital, crazy, wild hospital. Not, and I just, you know, you can imagine what I was thinking. I think, God, what has happened? I mean, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to think. All I knew is how bad I was still hurting, and I didn't know. I, now I'm thinking, how are we going to make it? Where are we going to get the money to pay this bill? Where are we going to get the money to live? You know, and you can imagine. <clears throat> and years ago, I had a Presbyterian pastor that God used to get us all saved and born again, my family. We had kind of gone our separate ways. He was, his name was Lim. Titsworth, big, tall guy. He's probably about 6'5", <clears throat> very soft-spoken. And out of the blue, this guy comes walking through that door of that hospital room, and he just very briefly greets me after I hadn't seen this guy in years. <clears throat> and he says, I've come to pray for you, son. I said, thank you. And he laid over in a voice of a whisper. He said, Father, put concrete in Byron's backbone. Give him alligator skin. Make him hard to these circumstances. Cause him not to stay here, but to rise up and get out of this place and get out of this room and go on with his life. Now, he wasn't yelling like that. He was just whispering to me where I could hear him in, in my ear. And I tell you, the Holy Spirit came over me. Goosebumps hit me. He turned around without me being able to thank him, and he walked out of the room. And as quick as he came and quick as he gone, I was a changed young man. Because, buddy, from that time forward, all I knew I wanted to do was to get out of there and go on with my life. And that was what God wanted me to do. He was quit saying, son, why did this happen to you? You'll never know. But I kept you. You're still alive. A few seconds later, that bullet would have caught me right here in the side of the neck. The, the police came in because I was sitting down, leaning over the table, couldn't figure it out, hit my, stood, bam, it caught me here in the gut. I would have, Renee would have found somebody else by now. <laughs> I would have been a memory that y'all never would have known about. But anyway, you know what? <clears throat> That's what God when you're sitting there wondering what, Lord, in the world has just happened to me, God's saying, this is what's happened. I've put in front of you a door, and it's time to get up and move out of this place you have been. You have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. That's in the scripture there when God finally told Israel, <clears throat> you, it's come, it's come, the door's come. Are you listening to me? God's wanting that in your life. The next thing God does, he wants you to remember something, his faithfulness. He wants you to forget all the questions that are unanswered. He's going to roll away that stuff off of you as you remember his faithfulness. You'll never be able to forget unless you replace it with remembering his faithfulness. You just don't forget to forget. That don't work. Are you listening? You forget by remembering his faithfulness. Next thing, there's a change now coming in the provision of your life. <clears throat> Joshua 5, and they did eat the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. What happened when they finally came to a place of crossing over? Remember how they were being fed? Manna. They were on manna. It stopped. 
And the Bible says, verse 12, <clears throat> this is Joshua 5, and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten the old corn of the lamb. Neither had they the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now, <clears throat> what's easy to what's easy to interpret that is saying, well, God's going to bring a new source of provision in your life, a natural source, and that's true. Many times, that's exactly when your brook dries up, <clears throat> God will bring a new source, but. Let's look at it in spiritual terms that sometimes I have overlooked. God has brought me a provision in the spirit, an opening of the door that he says to you, finally, you're going to get to get into that prophetic spirit I have put in you years ago that you really don't know nothing about yet. You're going to start understanding how to move and work in the Holy Spirit. You haven't got it yet. The insight that I can bring you is waiting yet for you to explore and find. And God says all of that understanding is coming to you now. This is the open door. This is the opportunity to enter into an area that I've given you and you still don't know how it works completely. You'll never completely understand, but God's going to increase you in spirit. Growth and maturity comes in Christ. But you come to a place, you know, just like them, they ran out of the provision of the last season. What they were doing now wasn't working anymore. Have you ever felt this way? How come, Lord, I just can't get nothing out of your word? I can't pray. Uh, you know, when I go to church, I'm waiting for Brother Byron to say something good. <laughs> I don't know, Lord. And you go through a time that seems very lean in your life. And it seems like things have dried up. Do you know that's the Holy Spirit drying up all of that that you've known so that you can explore and you start pressing in to find out the new way, the new strength, the new power, the new hope that God has laid at your feet in this new season. You said, I never knew this. I never knew this part of me. I never knew I could explore walking in the Spirit walking in God's word, understanding his word, the revelation of God's word. I never knew it was, could be this way. God wants you to say that because the provision for you has changed. A new way of feeding on God's word, a new way of understanding the things of the spirit of God. That's part of what God has us right now. That's why it was so appropriate what Jeff was saying about coming into a new prayer language and growing and expanding yourself, that's so simple but so true, and it's something you can get busy doing immediately. Let me wrap this up. <clears throat> Where am I? There's a new level. Oh, let me read this to you concerning this. Whereby are given unto you exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now see, here's the addition. This is that part that God now wants to increase you. Add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, temperance patience, patience godliness, godliness brotherly kind, kindness, and to that charity, for if these things be in you and abound, they shall, you shall ne neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge. That's the revelation knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of this right here, God can apply to your own heart. Second Peter 1, 4 through 8. And you can say, Father, teach me how to add to my faith, how to add to my virtue. How can I grow in these areas? And in doing so, God's revelation will come to you on every every way, and you will grow and mature in your walk with God. Last thing I'm going to say here, <clears throat> you have to remember God's faithfulness, forget what's been left behind. You have to recognize the lack that you may be experiencing now is just a prelude to the abundance that is coming your way. That's what I'm saying here. And then the, an encounter with God. Remember this? After they got over and did all this, circumcised everybody, what happened? <clears throat> 
One day, Joshua is up, and he sees a, a fella with a sword drawn. You guys remember this story? Yeah. It came to pass that Joshua was by Jericho. He lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld. There stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua, being the warrior general that he was, <clears throat> went out unto him and said, Are you for us or for our enemies? And this guy says, Neither one, bud. But I have come as captain of the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord of hosts said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereon you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. <clears throat> What's absolutely necessary for our lives now is for us to have an encounter with God where we once again come to the complete revelation being captured with this. God is holy. God wants us to have once again an understanding of his holiness. And he told Joshua, take your shoes off, son. <clears throat> the place you're standing is holy. I wonder why he said, take your shoes off. Well, it was a custom, I, you know, I've read, I studied. It was a custom back in those days that taking your shoes off was a sign of submission, which would certainly apply to this, would it not? He's saying, submit to this. But another thing is, I can see where God says, I don't want nothing to stand between you and my holiness. I want you to experience it, son. I want you to get your toes in there and touch it <clears throat> and feel it and be affected by it. My holiness, what, is a, what in the Old Testament was called the most holy thing? Anybody? The holiest of all. What was that? The holy of holies. Anybody remember what that was? The Ark of the Covenant inside the tabernacle at this time. Behind the veiled wall, there was what? The Ark of the Covenant, gold seat upon a, a box. <clears throat> and there between the wings of the cherubim, the Lord said, there I will commune with you. His very presence inhabited that place. The most holiest thing in our lives that we could experience is the presence of God. It is not to be taken lightly. It is not to be uh, where we, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, take for granted. Thank you. You know, that's why when we're up here worshiping God, <clears throat> go ahead and take advantage of that time and acknowledge God's presence whether you feel like it or not. And worship God and enter in. That's the holiest thing you and I could do is to be in God's presence. It requires a separation from ourselves to God and from the things of this world to the Lord. Just like that old chorus, turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Remember this? In the light of his glory and grace. And that's exactly what God wants you to be affected with because what he is about to do in your life is something he deems as holy. It may be robed in little fleshly bodies called children in school or grandchildren or in, in, in co-workers or in just carnal things, but inside of that we have a treasure in earthen vessels. And for us to have to see beyond our natural eyes and see there's a work from God here that is a holy thing that I must treat that way. Are you listening to me? I don't know if you got that. I didn't explain it very well. <clears throat> the Bible says this. Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. There's a holiness in everything that God initiates in your life, whether it's very practical, whether it's very uh, common, whether it's just, you, but within that work comes from the presence of a holy God. And with us treating God as holy in our lives and what he wants us to do as a holy purpose in our lives, we respond correctly. It's when we forget I'm married to God's daughter. I'm married to God's son. I'm serving my employer 
as if it was the Lord Jesus Christ. I am doing what I need to do and treating other people as if they were the Lord. I'm walking in God. See, you see it through the eyes of the Lord. And doing so, you recognize the holiness of God in your life and in what he is doing among you. Now you're ready. After you have remembered his faithfulness, forgot that horrible stuff from your past that you have no answers for. After you're realizing what's happening in my life, this, this seemingly short change of provision is not that. It's just a new provision coming your way. A new experience, things you've never known, places you've never been in spirit. <clears throat> and then God encounters you with his holiness. Now you're ready for the strategy. And God then gives strategies. He makes it very plain on how to capture this next area for you. We heard a strategy here in this house. We've, we've experienced it and been practicing. You know what it was? When Jeff gave us by the Holy Spirit, there, there's our new strategy here. It's prayer, praise, and the prophetic. Let's arm ourselves with such and let's rise up and God make me a house of prayer. Are you listening to me? And we begin to praise God and we begin to pray, uh, praise and prayer and we begin to remember the prophetic word God has spoken and we use that as a sword and we declare and proclaim the word of the Lord. You know, the strategies of the Lord really are pretty simple. God's not going to make it difficult. You think, well, <clears throat> he's going to really have a 50-point outline of everything I need to do. And you know, it's not, you know what the first... <laughs> The, it's so funny. If you look at the strategy that the Lord told Joshua, he said, I'll make this as Byron translation again. <laughs> he said, you know what you boys been doing? You got real good at walking around that mountain? Walk around this city here seven times. But instead of all the complaining I had to put up with, y'all just be quiet and walk around. See if you can get this right this time. And we just get out of here after seven days. Forget this 40 years. He didn't make it tough, did he? You know, God doesn't want to make it hard for you where you have to take the ACT and the CTE and the ABC test. And <laughs> then that judge, hey, you missed it there, son. Go again. I don't know. You know, I mean, he's making it to where you can do it. He said, just be obedient. Look at here. This is how you do it. You use prayer, praise, and the prophetic. Watch this thing go. You, and he starts breaking down to you some very simple things, strategies for your life now, right now where you're at. The Holy Spirit is then impressing you already on these things. You already know. There's been something coming to your mind time and time again, something simple, but something you're not doing now or you're not nearly doing enough. He's already done. He just told me he's already been speaking to this bunch right here. <clears throat> you already know it. You have time to turn your attention to it and make it a matter of prayer and see what God will do for your life. I see an open door Open wide So wide We're going past the threshold Leaving the past behind Remember the faithfulness of God, of God, equipped with weapons, guaranteed to win. We're gonna win. Oh, I see an open door. Open wide, so wide, we're going past the threshold, leaving the past behind, way behind, I will remember the faithfulness of God. with 
weapons guaranteed to win. We're gonna win. I am a house of prayer. I am a house of praise. I am a house full of power. of prayer. I am a house of praise. I am a house full of power. Oh, I am a house of prayer. I am a house of praise. I am a house full of power. I am a house of praise. I am a house of prayer. I am a house full of power. I see an open door, open wide, so wide. We are going through the threshold, leaving the past behind. Remember the faithfulness of God. We are equipped with weapons and we're guaranteed to win. We're gonna win. Oh, I am a house of praise. I am a house of prayer. I am a house full of power. I am a house of praise. I am a house of prayer. I am a house full of power. We're gonna win.